Welcome to Forum 360. I'm your host, Leah Love, where we have a global outlook from a local view. Today, we have Miss April Stevens joining us today, and she has an impressive resume. So I'm just gonna read just a little bit in a snippet for you. Um, she is a former board member, member of the Autism Society of Greater Akron. She launched and facilitated a new Summit County program called Coffee, Tea, and Autism in Northwest Akron, which provides resources, information, and referrals for those affected by autism. But most importantly, she's the mother to her son, Xavier, who has autism. So today we are going to talk about autism, in particular, how it affects minorities. So you recently started a company. Tell me about your company. Sure, the name of my company is called Autism from Another Spectrum. And we basically provide webinars for caregivers of people that have special needs, in particular autism. Autism is a comorbid disorder, so it comes with a lot of things associated, including ADHD, um, PDD. I can give you a whole list of other acronyms that yeah. comes with it. So we address all of those in our webinars, but we also provide customized training to organizations that help with the special needs community. Our focus is multicultural individuals with special needs and autism. Awesome. Um, so tell me how you realized that your son was autistic. At 18 months, he started banging his head on the floor and he wasn't feeling the pain. And then he started doing self-stimulatory behaviors um, like rocking, that's something that they, they do. Um, and then his words started to disappear, like words that he was gaining just disappeared over a period of time. He said at 18 months. At 18 months. Um, and then I noticed that he would walk on his tiptoes when he started walking and he started flapping his arms, he started spinning in circles and he became someone that I didn't know, to be quite honest with you. I'm like, okay, where are the words? What's going on? I mentioned it to my pediatrician. She referred me to a neurologist who referred me to a speech therapist who referred me back to the neurologist. So this was going on for two years. I was just on this merry-go-round trying, you know, trying to find a solution to what was going on. So finally, I found someone that was able to diagnose him. He was three years old. And by the time he was diagnosed, we missed the early intervention services, which is critical for people with special needs, especially children with special needs, because if they don't get that early intervention, they miss out on therapy that they need to have a better outcome in life. For example, mm -hmm. speech therapy, occupational therapy, uh, physical therapy. And just to explain what those therapies provide, speech therapy helps with communication because mm -hmm. a lot of people with autism have difficulty with verbalizing social communication, understanding social cues. Um, they are hypersensitive to sound, so they provide also sensory diets to help them better align themselves with their environment. For example, my son has hypersensitive hearing. He also had issues with his vision and a whole multitude of medical issues that I didn't even know about in working with the regular pediatrician because they're not really trained on you know, the signs, the symptoms, the medical challenges that the children may have. And as a, a person who's African-American, my concerns weren't taken seriously either. You know, I was put on that merry-go-round to go to the neurologist who basically hit his knee, he lifted his leg up, oh, he's okay. Mm -hmm. He referred me to the speech therapist, back to the neurologist, and it got to a point where I was like, okay, um, everybody's getting paid, but my son is not getting help. And so I was able to find a doctor at um, Cleveland Clinic who was able to diagnose him. They did it in the same day, which is like something that they never do. So it was like a miracle, like finally, okay, he's diagnosed. They provided a 14 page report. And that's really all I wanted. Like, okay, what is autism? How do we treat it? What are the therapies available? And what are the resources available to me? At the time I was living in Summit County, I didn't know anything about Autism Society of Greater Akron. So my only source of information was based out of Cleveland through an organization called Milestones. At Milestones, I located his first speech therapist who were also African American. And it was at that point where, you know, he was like um, on the verge of being severely autistic because he was, he was nonverbal. Like there was no sound that came from Xavier's mouth for six years. There was no sound from my son. Um, so these spe speech therapists provided, you know, speech therapy in our home. They came to the daycare. 
we start with sign language because children with autism or even an adult with autism have to understand that they have to communicate in some way, form, or fashion to get what they want, even if it's using the PEC system, which is using like the picture exchange communication system. We started with that. We started with sign language. And then through biomedical treatments, speech therapy, <laughs> occupational therapy, any kind of therapy you could think of, yeah. um, that's when Xavier really started coming out of it. Because when he was diagnosed, the doctors was like, you know, he would never say, I love you. He'll never have friends. He'll never ride a bike. This is what let they me, say to you. Let me back up just a little bit. Define autism for those who aren't familiar with what autism is. Sure, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, some people are born with it. Sometimes something can trigger it. I've met families from all different types of situations. I know a mom who had twin sons. One has autism, one doesn't. Um, I know a mom who has twin sons. One has autism caused by a brain stroke that happened when he was an infant, so he became autistic because of that. I've met families who said that they were vaccine injured, you know, and that caused their autism. Um, it's, it, it, there's different types of autism. That's another thing that people have I to understand. I was about to ask you, what are some of the different types, though? Yes, it's, it, think of it as like a <clears throat> rainbow, and, and that's why we call it, you know, autism spectrum disorder, because you can go from mild, moderate to severe. A person with mild autism probably has some difficulty with social situations. Um, they may have like self-stimulatory behavior, but they're able to function. Sometimes they can be in special needs classrooms. Sometimes they can be in typical classrooms. It just depends because even within the mild, moderate, and severe, you have other things that come with it. Maybe they have sensory issues. Maybe they have medical issues. Maybe they don't have the ability to understand social cues, which can cause a problem when a child is becoming a teenager. You know how kids can sometimes be cruel mm -hmm. and they don't understand what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, if people are making fun of them, if people are their friends. So that's difficult to navigate. Okay. Um, so how is it diagnosed? And you said there's not really a cause, it's just something that either they can be born with or something that can occur to cause it. Yes. They're not really sure. Right. Okay. Exactly. Um, because there's so many different types of autism. Um, you have people that are savants who are extremely bright, extremely intelligent. When people think of autism, they think of Rain Man. Mm -hmm. That's their idea of autism. Um, but I always tell people if you met one person with autism, you met one person with autism because each person is different. With my son, he's musically inclined, he's amazing at computers, but if you try to put him in a social situation, <laughs> good luck because he's limited you know, with his verbal communication and understanding social cues. And, um, but he's super bright, super intelligent. We just have to focus on his strengths and minimize his weaknesses. And as with any child or adult, people do better when you have a higher expectation and they have the therapy that they need and they're diagnosed properly. One thing that we know is that African-American children and Hispanic children are diagnosed two years later compared to the white peers. So that makes a big impact on their lives because if they're not diagnosed, misdiagnosed, or don't have a diagnosis, yeah. what type of therapy or intervention are these kids receiving? And how will that impact their lives in, in the future? Does it tend to manifest any differently in different races or between genders, male versus female? Does it manifest any differently or is it still the same based on that person? It's pretty much the same based on the person. I think what makes the difference is the culture. Uh, for example, in China, for example, it's not so much the manifestation, it's how people are provided with help. In China, autism-related services is cut off at 13 years old. Okay. So after a child turns 13, that's it. Wow. They don't get therapy. They don't get services. That's it. Um, what is it here? In America, it's 21. Okay. That's not too far off. Yeah. You, if you have a child in high school, yeah. you know, you're looking at, I don't know, if, if your child is 16 and mm -hmm. five more years, 21, then what do you do with them? And that's the struggle that a lot of parents face once their child reaches the age of 21. Well, what, you know, where do they go? Do they work? Do they go to school? Can they go to school? Can they work? And I need to answer that because yes, they can if they get the proper therapy and services yeah. that they need and also support. Yeah. 
Um, the Autism Society of America was started by parents, just like regular parents who wanted to help their kids. And that's where most of the help comes from when you're dealing with special needs kids. It is the parents, because we're the ones that have to think about their future. It's not the therapists, it's not the doctors, it's the caregivers. Uh, so what are some of the misconceptions about autism? Well, let's start with the diagnosis. Some people think that if they can look you in the eye, then they don't have autism, and that's not true. Sometimes it could be a cultural thing where a child looks at an adult in the eye or doesn't look in the eye. Um, it, and it, there's plentiful, plentiful different ideas of, of what autism is and what it looks like. And a lot of it's based on bias, a lot of it's based on ignorance, a lot of it is based on a stigma because autism carries a certain stigma to it. Just like a, a kid with Down syndrome, they're thought of as being less than, and they're not less than, they're actually extraordinary if we can tap into their gifts and talents. Mm -hmm. You know, every time I look at Xavier, I'm amazed because he can think things and outsmart me, but he's not able to verbalize it. Yeah. So to me, that's like a gift, and you have to find a way to channel that energy. Yeah. If you are just joining us, we are talking to April Stevens, and we are talking about autism, and in particular, how it affects minorities. Um, so going back, what is the effect of bias when diagnosing children of color with special needs? The effect of bias, well, there's several. Uh, there's, there's unconscious bias and there's conscious bias, and sometimes, if you're a single parent, or if you're a parent who's a different race, what, what have you, people have this perception of who you are versus doing their job, which is to diagnose the child. Um, so sometimes, like, if you are a single parent and you go in for a diagnosis, you know, your concerns are discounted. Or they think you have six children at home and, and you're a bad mother or whatever, they, or you have the child has a deadbeat dad or whatever, mm -hmm. rather than doing their job, again, which is to use the diagnostic criteria for autism. Um, and the impact is that that child does not get the support and services that they need. Not only does the child get affected, the family gets affected. Because now you have a stressed out parent or caregiver, you know, trying to figure out how to help their loved one, but no one's helping the child mm -hmm. because of the bias. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be racial bias, that could be based on socioeconomic factors, marital factors, your gender, your sexuality, whatever people see you as. Mm -hmm. So bias affects treatment, it affects therapy, it affects placement of the child in the educational setting, it also affects their resources, the referrals for the caregivers, it affects medical treatment because a lot of kids with autism have medical issues and if they're not diagnosed and they're not provided the same information as a typical white family, you miss out on the treatment of your child. I know with my son, I had to find a biomedical doctor, a holistic doctor, to get to the root of his issues. Discovered he has low immune system. Discovered that he had just a terrible digestive system. And there's been studies to prove that people with autism have different bacteria in the gut, and we know that the gut is connected to the brain. So if you have the, you know, <laughs> the wrong type of bacteria, mm -hmm. that's going to affect some things. Yeah but also financial resources. You know, a lot of parents of color, they're not able to take off and attend therapy and find the best solutions for the mm -hmm. child. And they don't even know, to be honest with you. Yeah. They're not given that same information as white parents. They're just not. Um, and not only African-American parents, but also, you know, people that are Asian or African or Indian or N Native American, mm -hmm. people of color. So that is one of the reasons why when I was a peer facilitator for the Coffee, Tea, and Autism program, I wanted to create an environment where people could be honest and transparent and tell me what their challenges were in regards to having a child with autism and other special needs. Mm -hmm. And what I learned from that is that we are all in the same boat. We are all facing the same challenges as people of color. Mm -hmm. First of all, getting a diagnosis, getting support from the school system, um, medical professionals, you know, we know that African Americans and Latino children mm -hmm. or people do not receive the same medical care as other people mm -hmm. for whatever the reason. So that definitely impacts not only the child, it impacts the family, 
it impacts, it's, you know, it, it's like a pyramid or a domino effect. Are teachers allowed to um, say anything about if they feel like a child may, may be autistic? Yes. They are? Do yes. they Do they have, um, how big is their role as educators or teachers in this pathway? I think they, if they notice that a child is not, may have autism, mm -hmm. they should have the conscious and the fortitude to alert that parent. Um, and and there's, there's a BCMH which is available for people who may have low income. I didn't know anything about BCMH. I didn't qualify for it at the time, but boy, it would have been what nice that to, for? that's the Bureau of Children of Medical Handicaps. Okay. And what they do is that they will provide you with the referral to get the help that you need and provide you with financial resources to get the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times people are hesitant because they don't have the money for a psychologist to diagnose their child with autism. Mm -hmm. Understandably. Uh, what does early intervention look like? Early intervention looks like someone coming into your home or the daycare, coming into the child's environment, providing speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, whatever that child may need for their development and growth, um, just they will come in and do an assessment, like a speech therapist will come in and test the child to see if they're at the level that they should be at. Because a lot of children of color, when you don't know about early intervention or help me grow or the Department of Developmental Disabilities or anything like that, they miss out on that. And that can cause problems when they're in school and performing because then you have the preschool to prison pipeline. And we know that through the US Office of Civil Rights that African American children are suspended out of school more often than any other race. We also know that children with disabilities are suspended more than any type of child, mm -hmm. especially in the state of Ohio, it's double Wiley. for students with disabilities that they're suspended. And I think a lot of that has to do with parent not only parents, but teachers not being trained. Because this world of autism, it changes every day. Every time I think I say, oh my God, I, I figured it out. Something new comes along. And you have to be held accountable to keep up with the most recent information so that you can better serve your clients, the students, and the parents. And when we don't do that, we fail the children and their caregivers. And not only that, but we fail society because sooner or later these kids are going to grow up and they're going to be in the work world or a college or they may be your doctor or a physician or scientist um, but when we don't treat everyone equally we all pay for it absolutely so what as a parent um, and a mother tell me if you were talking to another parent and you had to prepare them for this journey that they're about to take, what are gonna be some of the things that you would tell them to help them prepare, some of the challenges that they're gonna face, um, even some of the things that you just wish you would have known or maybe been able to handle a little bit differently? Mm -hmm. um, the first thing is getting that diagnosis and, and also encouraging them to get it because I've, I've noticed just from talking to other parents that there's a stigma to autism and there's nothing wrong with their child and this is their perception. Their child is perfect and there's nothing wrong with your child. Your child is different and they need therapy and they need help and they need resources. And a lot of that comes from a sense of pride, which is not unusual, mm -hmm. but you have to get rid of pride and remember to stay focused because the focus should be on your child and doing what's in the best interest of your child. Um, and don't be afraid of you know, labels, that's another thing that they are ashamed of. Labels will get you the help and support that you need. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn that myself mm -hmm. because when Xavier was diagnosed, it was MRDD. Okay. And I was like, oh, I don't, yeah. no, ment no, mental, no, no, yeah. I can't, can't accept that. Yeah. But I had to get over that. And that's where, you know, he was able to get the best help because first of all, we had to get that diagnosis. We had to find out the resources for them. Um, and last but not least, because there's a whole list that I have for them, don't be afraid to attend autism conferences. That was my, that was like my savior when trying to get help for Xavier. Um, going to not only, you know, the, the conferences by Milestones and Autism Society of Greater Akron, 
But I remember getting up at three o'clock in the morning, driving to Michigan to attend a biomedical conference. Mm -hmm. It was me, my mom, my son, and my aunt. Because when you're trying to get help for your child, you make the sacrifices and you do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. And be careful of evidence-based therapies because what works for one doesn't work for another. Um, there's been so much research on the different therapies available for children, including, you know, the gluten-free, casein-free diet. If your child doesn't have a food sensitivity to gluten or dairy or peanuts or what have you, putting them on that diet may not help <laughs> what their situation is. Yeah. So don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Tap into your faith, because if it wasn't for my faith, I would not be sitting here with you. I, I'm not going to tell you that that diagnosis was easy to swallow because it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was a hard pill to swallow because I felt as a mom, well, why, you know, why didn't I see it or what, what could I have done better? There was really nothing that I could have done better. I didn't have the resources, didn't have the help, didn't have the support that I needed. But even with saying that, because of my faith and what I believe in, he's a miracle child. I mean, Xavier's playing the piano. He's singing. I tell people he'll pray for you now. Mm -hmm. This is a child who couldn't talk, yeah. who will now pray for you. He's won art contests because of his art. He's doing great in school. I have a great school district that I'm working with. Be an advocate for your child. No mm -hmm. one can advocate for your child like you can yeah. because no one knows your child like you know them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, And also learning about the different special, edu special education laws that are in effect through rights law. I knew nothing about rights law knew nothing about it until like a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I learned from another parent yeah. at my, you know, my parent support group. Yeah. And that, you know, that just goes to prove you learn more yeah. from other parents than the medical professionals. But there's all types of special education laws that can be applied if people know about them. Mm -hmm. The school district is not going to tell you. They'll tell you about the IDEA Act, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Educational Act. But you have to dig deeper into that to find out what your child's rights are as a student with disabilities. For example, with Xavier, I learned that they were testing him in an environment where there was a ticking clock. So every time the clock ticked, he looked at it, which affected his ability yeah. to do the test. Mm -hmm. So I made it a point for them to remove the clock out of the room right, right. because that's his right. You, it has to be an appropriate environment for him to succeed. Mm -hmm. He's not going to succeed if he has distractions. Right. And we know that people with autism sometimes can have ADHD and they are easily distracted. So minimize those distractions to help them to become successful. <laughs> now you mentioned resources. What are some of um, the resources that are local that people can become involved with? Autism Society of Greater Akron. Mm -hmm. um, and they are basically in downtown Akron. Okay. Also Zane's Foundation, because a lot of times people with autism and other special needs have medical issues that are very expensive. I know some insurance companies still do not cover speech therapy, which I cannot believe. They don't cover ABA therapy, which is very expensive. And what is that? That's applied behavior analysis. So mm -hmm. that's when you have a therapist who will provide tasks that the child needs to complete so that they can move on to the next level. Um, my insurance company just started covering that April of this year. Okay. It would have been nice to have that 10 years ago yeah. because it probably would have been you know, further along, but I'm grateful that it is now covered. But also um, Milestones, um, which is based out of Cleveland, but they help everyone in Northeast Ohio. And they have a national autism conference, just like the Autism Society of Greater Akron has a national autism conference. Ocali, which is the Ohio Center of Autism Low Incidence. That's a long, long word. <laughs> and they're based out of Columbus, Ohio. Uh -huh. They provide all types of information on their website, a free, re free resources for caregivers of people with special needs, including presentations on you know, how to address puberty in people with autism, which is another world in itself yeah. because the hormones are kicking in, plus there's all those wonderful things going on with autism <laughs> already. So it's an exciting time for caregivers during yeah. that time. Um, so I mentioned Ocali Autism Society of Greater Akron, Milestones, Zane's Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, people can contact them. What I love about them is that it's not based on income. They see the need of the person that may need financial help in the areas of speech therapy, um, summer camp, whatever, you know, wheelchairs, whatever you can think of. 
But as Real, I mentioned, go ahead. Okay, sorry. That's Real me. quick. Yes. Tell me um, one thing that you love to do with your son and how people can reach your company if they want to have um, more access. Sure. One thing that I love to do with my son is attend church service because he loves church. He's the type of kid who will cry if we don't go to church and he's 13. So that's a blessing in itself. I think he realizes that that is where he got his help with his autism and that's where he will continue to get his help. And you can reach me <laughs> at 833-203-2327. My email address is af as in Frank, A as in April, S as in Sam, 18 at yahoo.com. And I'm also on Facebook at autism from another spectrum.com. Great. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm your host, Leah Love, and we want to thank April for coming and just giving us a very, very good understanding of dealing with autism um, and in particular those with minorities. Thank you and you have a wonderful weekend. Forum 360 is brought to you by Electrical Impulse Communications, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, an anonymous donor, the Jewish Community Board of Akron, Medical Mutual of Ohio, Blue Green, and Forum 360 supporters.